Hi guys. So, I think I'm running out of time for filming videos um, right now. I'm having tons of trouble with my computer when I'm video editing and things are just um, getting so crazy. But anyway, I wanted, for those of you who may have started a horse already or some other animal, I wanted to just show you the way that I do this and as quickly as possible, mostly by talking about it. Those of you that are really, um, really motivated and have watched all the other videos on how I do uh, raw edge and free motion quilting and all that, um, that, that you might be able to run with this if you've actually already done some of the projects. And But anyway, I, I'm going to work on this horse just enough so you can see what I'm doing. But I want to make a big warning right now, which is that um, the reason I have this semi-industrial Bernina that has no computer component and no fancy dancy anything is because, um, and maybe my servo does now, maybe I could crash my servo, I don't know. I could always put in my other motor if that happened. But, um, the reason I have this, which I think it's a three-quarter horse now with the servo and was half a horse when I bought it with the other motor, if I'm remembering correctly, um, <laughs> horse, um, no pun intended. <laughs> um, the reason I have this machine, which was uh, 15 years ago, was $3,500. was $3,500 and they don't make them anymore I don't know what it would cost but it was so that I wouldn't wreck my computer computerized machine that was a couple thousand and I had bent my needle bar going through too many layers of fabric and uh, I was warned that uh, that was a seventy dollar fix but if I crashed my motherboard it was going to be seven hundred dollars and those of you that have seen my other videos have heard that story I'm sure I tell it fairly often and so what I'm planning to do here is there will be horse hair mane coming in here and coming over here, may even go over a little bit over the eye and humped up here sort of behind the ear. And then I love it to run back and really trace back. And so this is almost all going to be mane and maybe some hanging down and then down here all mane. And because if you were doing the the back, the back would come across here, and I could certainly add paint. I don't know if I still have those exact colors, so I'm not going to. But so this is all going to be main, and that's going to be added at the end. The first thing I'm going to do is plant my foreground, midground, and uh, background behind these areas, and it'll come over a little way because if the if the main kind of is PC. You know, like I like it when my hair is PC. If the mane is PC back here, you might see a little bit of whatever my midground is, and up here you might see a little bit of that um, sky. And so what I'm going to do is look for fabrics for that. Okay, so I've started putting this in, and um, that's going to go behind the ears and at the top of the hair, and maybe a little bit PC through here this area here, the back of his head. So really what I want to do is stitch him and I don't want one, you know, really cheesy line around there. I kind of want to, um, you know, I'll, I'll go and then I'll go back and then I'll go and I'll kind of shape just like you would if you were sketching. I'll kind of sketch around him, I think. I, because I, I've taken, I've taken a fair amount of art class, but it's pretty far behind me now. Um, but when I do a face, and you know, I'm trying to work up to human faces. Um, one of the things I think about is not what shape I think it is because I especially when you're not looking you know 
at the front of something, but what the sh shadows and the highlights do. I try to just follow the shadows and the highlights and the basic outline and hope that it looks like what it's supposed to look like. I really like the horse to have a whole bunch of different uh, colors of thread and styles of quilting and I like to do some that are really quilty. Like I love to find some areas where um, kind of big areas especially on the neck not as much on the face um, but maybe a little where there's like a true just a stipple a, me a tiny meander a stipple where you don't cross over and it just actually looks like quilting. And I don't know if you can see, if I do this, maybe you can. Can you see all the sparkle in this horse? That's, that's why I'm working on the sparkly fabric. Now what I'm going to do here is um, cut away. And this here shortened. I didn't really want to go up quite so high, so I just shortened it. And, okay. And I'm going to cut this back, even though... I'm going to just leave it flapping. If you make one of these, you're going to have a lot of stuff flapping around when you are working on the mane. It's pretty reasonable at this beginning stage. But now I've basically got this horse. And uh, if you look at the other horses I've done, I've put lots of pictures of them all over the place. You'll see that I'm trying to you know, the, the front of the horse's head is sort of a, a plane here, and then it sort of angles, and there's sort of a plane on the snout, and there's some really nice kind of angling into the cheek that goes on. And then with your eye, there's often a lot of shadow on the eye, um, but it's been pointed out to me that horse's eyes are not almond. And so, uh, and the, the nostrils, you can do very interesting things with the nostrils. And if you look at a lot of horse pictures, you can kind of get a feel for just how powerful and muscular a horse is, even just in its nostrils. And I, I don't know, I thought horses were really cool when I was a girl. And maybe in a way, when my kid was into My Little Pony, this is sort of a little throwback to that for me when I was making these. But I live in Montana where, uh, you know, when when we've looked at property here, it's like if you're out in the valley, a lot of the places are horse property, um, which would be a lot for us because we would never get a horse. But anyway, so then the next thing I would do is start stitching my horse. And like I say, I would find some places to just really play. I like to do it on the jaw sometimes, as well as the neck, and do some stippling. And just do a lot more of this kind of stuff, switching back and forth between thread colors. And, you know, a horse could have a sort of a place where he goes sort of like this. And so you might be able to just make this work, because I do kind of like this. I just. You just need to try to shape it so it looks horse-like as you're doing it. And so um, maybe I will do a little bit more attaching of him and a little bit more of his basic shape. And I hope I don't mess him up because I'm rushing. And I've been rushing for a while now. And it's not, it's, you make mistakes when you rush. It's pretty clear. So anyway, um, I like to follow some of these paint lines and I'm just going to do some stitching that sort of does that and get the back of this horse cut off. Now keep in mind, a ton of this will get covered with, with parts of the mane and so if you do anything that you just think, oh that's ugly, but try not to pucker up and if you need to baste all this basic layer and see, he's starting to pucker a little, so when I'm quilting him, I'm going to really need to manage that. And so I'm not going to, I'm not going to quilt across an area where I know I'm going to make a bunch of puckers at the side. I'll try to like quilt through and split the difference and, so that it just adds texture to him instead of making him look bad. 
But anyway, I'm going to do a little bit more down here, and I, I kind of usually put these sort of V's on the this part, and I'm going to do some of that with this thread color while I've got it. All right. I'm not sure about that, but what the heck. I think I've done enough with this one thread color. Okay, so what I'm seeing here is an opportunity to kind of have, since there's such an overlap here, kind of have it be like this could be some grasses. And so I'm going to kind of do up and down and then maybe be able to cut out here. And then I'm just going to go with that and fill this up and then I'll do some over there too. And then I kind of like the way that color looks, pulling out some of the colors of the roosters. And I don't know if that looks stupid. It doesn't look like real grass. I don't know what it looks like. Um, it's supposed to indicate sort of a plant life. That'll just give me a kind of a live area where I can maybe have a little gap in the mane and have that show through and give it a little more complexity. I'm going to do pretty small peacocks and rivers, I think. I also wanted to mention that the last two videos I've talked about and then cut it out. Um, the beginning of broadcast news, the one with Holly Hunter and Albert Brooks and William Hurt, where uh, Holly Hunter is sitting on a bed just crying her eyes out at the beginning of the movie. And I always thought that was so weird when I was younger. And then when I became a mom, I kind of could understand that sometimes, just needing to go off and just cry. And um, lately, more than ever, put it that way. This is the part where if I have gaps in the main, you'll be able to see some stitching, but I'll purposely not put a gap where there's no stitching or I would add stitching there. And this part here, I almost kind of wish that were more horse there, but it isn't, so I'm going to have to deal with that somehow. And I have to figure out how the mane comes up and appears to go behind, even though I didn't leave a space for it to go behind. I certainly could have. I'm just out of practice. I think I'm going to paint on, st stitch on here and paint on here more, but I want to start addressing this mane. And what I can say is, if you look back at some of the pictures of my pieces, I uh, always like to put lots of different colors and many, many different layers. When I do that, I work out of my scrap bags, and I've got some pretty big scraps in here. And so, a nice kind of sort by color, you know, like this, I love this fabric, and I've had. I used to have a ton of it. I'm, I'm not even sure why it's in the scrap bag. It's actually bigger than I normally classify a scrap. But anyhow, it, it's a good thing because it allows me to talk about what, what I want to say. With the way I've always done them, I would get smaller pieces, scraps, and I would take and I would start to put them down to do the main, I would sort of start placing in whatever I thought I was going to do. And I wouldn't necessarily just go with reds and blues, but this is how I work. Just kind of getting the main in there. And honestly, with my machine, I haven't needed to think a ton about how many layers I might be going through in some places. But I think you might need to think about that more with uh, regular home machines, and I certainly would with, um, with my computerized machine. And because of the crash that I had, what I would do, and so I guess I'll try it with this project, even though I, it's not what I've done in the past. I would find one piece of big enough fabric 
which this happens to be, and I swear it's just a coincidence. But I would start with one piece of fabric that could cover everything that needs to be covered. I would sort of mark off my live area, get this bottom layer to where, and you might want to mark with something a little more permanent, permanent but what? but something that'll wash out. But be careful because many kinds of ink that will wash out won't if you iron them. And we certainly need to press this before it's gonna go in the laundry and it needs to go in the laundry. So I would get this basic shape in here. And I think I would leave these ears to last because I can get all this kind of stuff over the top. See, if I do it like this, then I can stitch down main. Um, where I'm going through this little bit of background, my batting, my actual backing, that's three layers, of course, four layers five layers, six layers. I can try to keep it to six layers because I, honestly, I think sometimes I go through 11 layers. Um, not that often, but I think I do it. I, I kind of go slower and try to think it through. But if you had it like this, you could, you could start to go um, and put in these pieces to plan this. And you could try to minimize the layering and you could count on this orange to come through the bottom to tie it all together. And I like to sometimes repeat the same fabric. And so I think what we're going to want to do is put all these fabrics in here and I've got this extra coming off the edge and I'm just going to trim that off. These kind of factory edges can become a troublemaker later on. And so I'm just going to cut him off so that I don't find that I want the fabric go that far and it's that white part. You, you need to really watch out for your machine, please. Honestly, when I stopped making videos, that was part of why I stopped, was worry about people thinking that they could try this at home without having anything close to the same kind of equipment that I've had to go to in order to even develop these techniques, much less do them over and over um, to sell. The sewing room was being um, rearranged before I started making videos. I'm usurping the room next door, which has a giant wall of books. The books were all over the room in little bookcases, and now they're all uh, four bookcases of them, books on top, then stopped, stacked high above. Um, even, that's not that high because there are angle walls in here. So I've cut away some orange uh, right where I know that I've got this uh, stuff I planted that could show through a flowing mane. And so I'm going to purposely try to let a little bit of that show in those places. What I want to do is anchor a few that'll tend to anchor down what's underneath and then I can and do that in a few places and then I can kind of work on the pieces that come out. It's the main that I'm the most concerned about because if you can artistically deal with your face it's really the the just sloppy, crazy, inherent chaos of this that I want you to see how I attempt to manage that. What I'm going to do, and see, I, I come through here, and so I'm going to mark with chalk what I'm trying to do. I, and I could have left more of this, 
but I usually don't. I, I'm trying to reduce layers back there. So I want to come all the way to here and cover that at the top. And it's going to be basically a sort of a whatever you call that shape, or it's sort of like a you know a diamond that's got a lot of squished parts. All right, let's see. And I I normally would sort of draw the whole thing. And if I were really trying to do you know, a great job. I might, uh, you know, turn this over, take pictures. I wouldn't trim these too small because it's the fact that it's not too small and you're not, you may at some point try to quilt really near the edge, but that's more problematic than quilting in the side of a margin a little bit. And I'm going to start up here where the critical area is so that I really get that attached where I want it. And this is the same brown that I used in the sky, a variegated brown, and that's okay with me. I'll do a few with this thread and then I'll switch. And I do like the threads to show up. And this, this might show up better if it were black, but I'm just going to proceed. This isn't a beginner project. If you haven't made like the little table mat or the tea cozy or some of those smaller projects, this is pretty advanced stuff, you guys. See, I've got this trying to pucker next to me. I'm just going to give him a little tug. And notice that when I had my hand really close, I didn't sew towards my hand. I'm sewing away from my hand. I need to plan what I'm doing here, and I think I'm going to do... something about like that. I'm just going to double check. See, I want to get past there, and I'm a little 3 eighths or half an inch past that, so that should be fine. So you want to go slow and, and think about what you're doing and step back and put it on your design board and leave it there for a day or two and ask your kids and your husband what they think about it and um, try not to get your feelings hurt but try to encourage them to be honest um, even when it does hurt your feelings because you'll learn stuff okay so I am going to attempt to make this look like something So I know I want to come past here and kind of cover that, but I, I think I want to do it with something that's sort of sticking down in the front and covering up the parts of the ear that I kind of find to be problematic. I, I just don't. And I'm going to sort of make this come like that, maybe. So this part, if I do this like this, is going to go sort of around the base of this ear a bit. So I'll make him as long as I can. And then I'm going to take the same hair and just sort of try to have it come off the back. All right. We'll just see. We're just going to do it and we're going to see. Okay. So I'm going to stitch this one. See, I don't know if you can see, and I'm not going to do the close-up, but uh, 
right where I go off the batting is about there and this tension gets all messed up because it doesn't really love going through two pieces of fabric like that. Okay. And you know, I'm not going to do binding on this because I've covered it in other things, but there are so many options. You could do a uh, raw edge binding that you stitch, uh, you know, to the back and then flip over and do raw edge in the front. Um, you could do a traditional binding sewn by hand. You could do one where you use the fusible um, to do a machine stitched binding. And I've got videos on all that. And uh, I, I hope they're not too hard to find. I, I could link all those in the description and direct you to places where I've covered stuff in other videos. Um, And it gets kind of hard to see what's underneath. I think this ear comes all the way down to here. Yep, I don't know if what I'm doing is going to make any sense, but we'll see. Maybe I'll make this piece go as wide there as I can. And then it needs to cover this. It needs to come over there. And then I could have it go sort of like that. And, you know, and it could have all this stitching. And kind of, kind of be like it comes sort of underneath that blue. And as I pull this back, I can even trim some of it away. Oops. Okay, so I just did what we're trying not to do. But it's good because I need to show you how you're going to fix things like that. And you need to be mindful of your getting too many layers. And because this is going to be a pretty small fix, I'm not going to um, use a different fabric. I'm just going to put a little bit of that orange under there. And so when I go to stitch that area, I'm going to be need to be really, really careful uh, to actually cover that part. Okay, and that's where you can get extra layers you weren't planning on. But right now, I'm going to stitch this, which will try to tend to attach my patch there. Now I like to just let this, let my foot push this up and then kind of stitch under this little flap because when this frays out, it's going to lessen. And so I, I stitch right up in there, underneath that flap. Once you get the hang of this, it's really, it's really not as crazy as, <laughs> maybe it is. <laughs> 